with celebrations on the streets in the Gabonese capital, Libreville, after the military removed President Ali Bongo, who claimed a third election victory on the 26th of August. Is it safe to now say the days of Gabon being run as a Bongo family business are finally over? And in Australia, the Anthony Albanese-led Labour government is set to introduce a new bill that regulates the wages and conditions under which gig workers operate, looking to grant them almost employee-like status. Why are industry leaders opposing legislation that seeks to protect the most vulnerable section of the working class? Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief, coming to you as always from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. For 56, almost 57 years, the Bongo family has run the oil-rich nation of Gabon as a personal fiefdom. Omar Bongo took office in 1967, less than a decade after independence from France, but supported the system that allowed France to maintain its sphere of influence in sub-Saharan Africa. His son Ali, who also served as a defence minister previously under Omar, took over the presidency following a 2009 election just two months after senior Bongo's death. In 2016, when Ali won his second presidential election, there were massive protests and the country's parliament was torched. Though Ali Bongo distanced Gabon somewhat from France and established the country as an environment leader, wealth inequality remains massive. Despite being among the richest countries in Africa, mostly because of its oil resources, over a third of the population remains below the poverty line. For context and the latest from the ground, we go to Kambale Musavuli of the Centre for Research on the Congo now. Kambale, good to have you on the show on Daily Debrief um, as always. Uh, tell us first, there's a new general uh, in charge in Libreville. Uh, what do we know about him? Uh, what are analysts saying uh, is likely to happen under sort of his charge now? No, Gabon surprised all of us on African continent. Uh, it was one of the least countries we thought the coup will take place uh, so soon as we are watching what was unfolding in uh, West Africa, particularly in Niger. But with uh, the coup uh, announcement at the national TV in uh, Gabon, and then later announcing that the new leader of Gabon is uh, General Ngema, uh, who leads the presidential guard, um, was quite a shocker because now we are trying to compare is this also similar to the anti-imperialist fronts taking place in Niger and Burkina Faso or Mali or is something that we should be cautious so what is his background um, he leads the presidential guard a few years ago he was uh, suspected uh, for being part of a coup plot uh, he was uh, removed for a while until he was reappointed to lead uh, the presidential guard. Uh, he is from the same ethnic group as the president. Uh, the presidential guard is virtually, uh, actually literally, a, a mono-ethnic um, military force. Uh, they are in charge of protecting the president of the country. Very well trained, very well equipped. Uh, but seeing what has unfolded uh, with the presidential guard actually taking uh, the lead for the coup. It seems to me that this is an internal fight within the Ali Bongo camp, uh, within uh, the elite that controls the country. You know, why am I saying so? Um, in past uh, situations in Gabon, anytime mm -hmm. there were protests, anytime there were uprising, it was the presidential guard uh, that was sent out to right. oppress the people to beat right. the protesters. So if a coup, uh, some analysts have said, if a coup had taken place and it was just the military, uh, the ordinary military taking place, we would have been worried to, to see, will the presidential guard support the coup and uh, fight those who are participating in the coup? But right. now, one of the top uh, mi uh, military force protecting the president, they are leading that. Mm. Um, we have to wait a few days to really understand, but at current time, as you look at what is happening, it appears to be uh, an internal fight within the Ali Bongo camp, uh, whereby um, the presidential guards took power. 
but there is a backdrop to that, right? How did they just fill up that void? There yeah. was a presidential election uh, in Gabon, and the process of the presidential election was more with so many irregularities. Uh, opposition leaders were barred uh, from actually campaigning. I think mm. uh, they gave them less than a month uh, to campaign. I think even a week, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> to campaign for the presidential elections. Uh, some of the polling stations uh, were open in the afternoon. So people did not get a chance to actually participate in, in the electoral process early in the morning. And not only that, they instituted a curfew <laughs> during the elections. So those who could not get to the poll on time were not able to vote. And when people start organizing and protesting all these irregularities, uh, the government or the country, or I should say the president, because mm -hmm. he's the one who leads the country, mm. decided to institute a, um, a cut off the internet, actually. Yeah. Internet so people could not communi uh, communicate with one another and sharing what was happening. So the tension was already very palpable in the country. Mm. We all knew that the election will be rigged. And when the election result was announced uh, on Sunday, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that Ali Bongo had won by 67%, uh, the tension within the country was already very strong. And of course, this is not the first time uh, that has happened. For the past decade, Gabonese have been organizing, protesting uh, in the streets against the regime of Ali Bongo, which is a continuation of what I call a dynasty. I think we can get into that more as we discuss. Yeah, yeah. So give us a bit of that context as well for those who might be unfamiliar with uh, the history of or the political history of, of Gabon since its independence from France, uh, Kambale. Uh, and also contextualize because the English media or at least sections of it uh, is viewing or is at least covering or analyzing this in terms of France's relations with these countries, uh, which is again a typical sort of prism through which uh, the Western press sometimes looks at events happening in these parts of Africa. Yeah, so the Gabon gained its independence from France in 1960. Uh, the leader then um, only led the country for seven years. Uh, his vice president took power uh, in an election, of course, uh, in 1967. That was Omar Bongo. And Omar mm. Bongo is the father of uh, Ali, Ali Bongo, Bongo today. Mm. Uh, Omar Bongo led the country all the way to the 2000s, right? So Ali Bongo is the third president of mm. Gabon mm. after literally uh, over 60 years, 60 years right, yeah. of um, the country being in existence. And uh, with that, 57 years of that time, Gabonese have been led by Omar Bongo and Ali Bongo, and Ali Bongo. a father and a son. Um, so it's pretty much you know, what, what many have seen it as this is a dynasty. Gabon is, is a very strategic country beyond what France may want to uh, do there in terms of the currency, the current, they use franc CFA, the mm. Central African franc CFA, which is also controlled by the Bank of France. Mm. Uh, but strategically, Gabon is right by the Atlantic Ocean in the uh, Gulf of Guinea space. Because of its geostrategic uh, position, it has also attracted beyond uh, France, also the United States. The United States, Africa is very active there. They actually have military operation in Gabon. They have military training with uh, Gabonese soldiers. Mm. Now, not only that, in the 2018 presidential elections in the Congo, Donald Trump uh, sent a letter to Nancy Pelosi uh, the Speaker of the House back then in the U.S. Congress, informing her that the United States was going to deploy 80-plus Marines to Gabon for uh, the, the potential election crisis in the DRC right. to protect you know, U.S. citizens and so on. So for us in the Congo, when we saw that, we said, wait a minute, Gabon it does a border the Congo. U.S. Marines are coming to Gabon. So Gabon must be a very strategic uh, country. So beyond that military uh, strat uh, strategic position that he has, 
he also has resources, yeah. uh, particularly oil. oil. You know, Gabon is a member of OPEC, and, um, and they produce a lot of oil. So destabilizing Gabon can actually cause um, challenges with a few prices around the world. So those two things are also at play uh, when it comes to uh, the geostrategic position of um, Gabon. But what is not to really discuss uh, that in spite of the, just the, the position of Western powers in Gabon, the people of Gabon have organized for over decades to make sure that they have the proper representation in the country. And it's unfortunate uh, to see um, that, of course, the people who are taking power are not the ones elected by the people. Uh, they're feeling a vacuum uh, that exists. The most organizing force in Gabon today is the military. Um, our hope is with this coup uh, that the, the voice of the people is protected, uh, the voice of the people is heard, and that the elected leaders of Gabon, um, the democratically elected leader of Gabon, is particularly even the opposition leader, is uh, able to regain control of the country and move Gabon forward. Right. Uh, finally, if we can uh, talk about the kind of uh, talk you're getting from the ground, uh, what are people saying, uh, people who are perhaps participating in the process of organizing uh, some of those voices and, and, and you know, making sure that it doesn't become a case of, uh, again, uh, a coup taking place, but then uh, the status quo being maintained and, and the old establishment elites uh, continuing to hold power and the massive uh, sort of wealth inequality that exists in Gabon uh, continues to persist. You know, there is something very powerful in uh, what happened, even with this contradiction. Um, the vast majority of the Gabonese are celebrating the end of the Ali Bongo rule. Um, because of the oppression that they face, uh, the fact that they have not had political space to choose their leaders. So it's totally understandable to see thousands of people in the streets celebrating the end of the Ali Bongo um, regime. At the same time, uh, there's, there's been a word of caution, uh, particularly from some of the religious leaders in Gabon, uh, some of the political voices, uh, journalists uh, who follow very closely the situation, in saying that the same way uh, there's been a silence around the organizing of Gabon, it, we risk to have the same situation with the coup, because there are many coups taking place on the African continent, yeah. and people may not pay attention uh, closely to what is happening uh, in Gabon. So they mm. are asking uh, the world to pay close attention to what is happening there, so that they, um, their revolution, the way they are presenting it, you know, this is a liberation, right? They've mm. been liberated from Ali Bongo, that the liberation of Gabon doesn't turn into uh, a force. And some African countries have faced that. Right? When we look, for example, for the Congo, in 1997, uh, the long-time uh, dictator, Mobutu, was toppled by a war, right? Uh, the, these rebels came into Kinshasa on May 17, 1997. They were able to remove Mobutu from power after 32 years of reign. But that did not bring liberation to the DRC. Today, you know, after two decades since 1997, we see that Congo has lost over 6 million people due to the conflict still being waged uh, for the mineral resources. Yeah. So when we look at Gabon, that's what we have to watch out for. But I, I want to also add last points you know, from the voices on the ground. Of course. You know, President um, Ali Bongo posted a video of himself yeah. uh, appealing to the world to come to and make noise. And make mm. noise, right? Mm. The Gabonese are very surprised that this video is circulating. The reason why they're very surprised that the video is circulating, just a few days before the video starts circulating, there was no internet mm. in Gabon. Mm. So the people of Gabon did not even have the opportunity to share their voice and to also make noise. Because yeah. the internet was not up. Hmm. But now that he's in captivity, uh, he called for support, not in the language of the Gabonese people, 
Mm. Right? The Gabonese have their local indigenous uh, languages and they also speak French. But mm. he made an appeal in English. In English. Mm. Which should actually give a sense to who uh, he listens he's, to or who he's actually who he wants working. to address. Yeah. Exactly. So he's not asking the Gabonese people to come and free him. He's asking those who have put him in, in power to free him. And that's the, the biggest uh, contradiction of his statement and that the people of Gabon are waiting for who is going to come and liberate him. Because for them, they feel liberated from him and they hope for a new Gabon for tomorrow. All right. Leave it there for today. Thank you very much, Kambali Musavuli, for joining us on Daily BB. And in Australia, the Labour government is building support for a bill called Closing the Loopholes, which seeks to protect and enhance the rights of gig workers, Uber drivers, delivery riders, for food ordering apps and others who do work of a similar nature, most of it uh, which is in the service industry, of course, uh, and is essential to the economy. But they work under conditions that make it increasingly difficult for them to make ends meet, despite longer hours and harsher working conditions. People's Dispatch's Anish has been covering the story and tells us more about the bill. Anish, good to see you back on Daily Debrief. Uh, first up, the bill is called uh, the Closing the Loopholes Bill. So clearly the government recognizing that there's an entire section of workers who are not covered and are therefore con probably considered the most vulnerable workers in uh, the entire Australian economy. Uh, what does the bill actually seek to address in terms of uh, regulations that will sort of uh, help these workers make ends meet? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, the bill will uh, introduce is this term called the employee like workers, which pretty much would be like a catch all term for anybody who's not uh, necessarily recognized as an employee, but definitely is a worker. And that is definitely something, uh, uh, you know, significant in this current scenario because. What you have when it comes to gig economy and uh, when it comes to workers in the gig economy, they're generally not considered as employees uh, under legal or their contractual obligations. And so uh, corporations uh, definitely have this chance of using that to uh, you know, pretty much exploit them for all sorts of things and give them no benefits whatsoever. Even uh, questions of minimum wages do not affect them, despite the fact that most of them and, you know, while being technically contractors, they pretty much work for this one single company or, uh, you know, platform. And that is pretty much that pretty much should define them as ideally as workers. Now, this is pretty much taking uh, a lot from the, the Californian uh, judgment uh, a couple of years ago uh, regarding the big economy. We did that on the show as well. Uh, about how there was this ABC rule of uh, deciding who is a contractor and who is a worker, basically, uh, uh, you know, pointing out that people who work on a single platform for most of their, you know, their working hours are pretty much, uh, you know, entitled to uh, be considered as laborers. And that yeah. pretty much gives them the right to negotiate, uh, to form perhaps unions, and to even go for collective bargaining, to negotiate their pay, their working hours, and even work conditions. That is pretty much a, sing a single most important thing. Now, mm. one of the reasons why this bill was pretty much fast forwarded was the fact that there was another death earlier this year uh, of a gig economy worker who uh, died in accident. And pretty much just it uh, opened up the whole uh, situation there where uh, overworking has led to uh, multiple deaths. Over 13 people have died in the last couple of years. And that has pretty much uh, led to the government fast tracking this bill right now. Right. Uh, Anish, I was in Australia recently uh, as well to cover the FIFA Women's World Cup. Uh, and what I found that in sort of these sort of cases uh, with, you know, uh, companies like Uber as well as uh, delivery companies, uh, whether it's food delivery or, or other companies like that, uh, in any case, because I suppose wages are different from, uh, from regular jobs, uh, it's migrant workers, new entrants into the economy who are generally taking these sort of jobs. And insurance particularly becomes a critical concern. Is that something that is also going to be addressed in any kind of uh, comprehensive manner? 
Well, right now, uh, we're not sure how uh, it will be in, uh, you know, put into effect. Uh, what we know is that they will essentially be considered as, uh, you know, as regular workers in most cases, and for pretty much all intents and purposes, uh, unless stated otherwise. Uh, and it, uh, the fact that it will also, the bill will also empower the Fair uh, Work Commission uh, pretty much also shows that they will have uh, the right to demand uh, the same kind of benefits, including, as you pointed out, insurance and uh, medical coverage uh, as workers, as laborers uh, in their respective apps and platforms. Uh, and this uh, is, but we have to uh, wait and see how the, you know, the nitty gritties of the law is going to be enacted. Uh, but definitely a welcome step because, A, as I said, like it brings out uh, the fact that these are definitely workers in, and brings them into the legal uh, fold of labor laws. Uh, but most importantly, as you pointed out, it brings into uh, coverage a large number of people who are, who are completely vulnerable uh, in the industry. And we are looking at about 200, 200 250,000 people who are in the gig economy already. And for a country like Australia, that's a huge number uh, in the, of the workforce. And as you pointed out, there are also a large number of them are ethnic minorities uh, or migrant workers. And obviously, they are, uh, you know, extremely vulnerable to a lo large number of, uh, you know, exploitation. And that uh, is pretty much what uh, this bill kind of seeks to address. But we'll have to, as I point, as I said, like we'll have to see how uh, you know the uh, the finer details of the bill uh, would be uh, enacted, and that is something that needs to be uh, like we have to remember that despite being a labor government, this yeah. government has uh, you know previously shown very pro corporate uh, tendencies Thank in the past, as, especially uh, the prime minister Albanese. Uh, but uh, in this current scenario, there is this is this bill is essentially uh you know uh something that was uh, that came about because of a large scale workers mobilization that australia has witnessed in the past several years and uh, definitely the kind of organization that gig economy workers have seen in the past couple of years especially uh, especially because of the intervention of the established trade unions and that is why this bill is pretty much here and we're talking about it as well and it probably will uh, will be a welcome step forward for everybody it definitely sounds like a welcome step forward. Uh, just a last bit, Anish, a response from some industry leaders in Australia uh, indicates, you know, how uh, statements like this will hurt both workers as well as uh, consumers. Uh, how do you respond to that kind of an approach uh, to, a, to, to, to a bill that looks to actually empower and protect uh, workers from the kind of exploitation you've spoken of? Well, uh, like their uh, argument is quite convoluted. Uh, if you look by some of the statements that have already been made, uh, pretty much there are arguments that it will actually uh, move up the cost of, uh, you know, your services uh, that uh, a large number of people do depend on, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the issue is that this, these, uh, uh, you know, th those costs need uh, need to be paid by the by the industry itself. Like the fact that a large part of their wages are still going to be like they will be dealt with as contractors. They will have to give a significant share of their wages as compensation to their platforms, and this will definitely continue. Uh, but what you're looking at is creating a baseline for wages for conditions, and these are not really going to like there are multiple studies that show that it is not going to impact that significantly to consumers as well. But it is definitely going to impact the profit margins of uh, multiple corporates. But we have to also remember that this bill is in making for nearly two years now, like uh, especially from the promises that Labour Party made in 2021, uh, and the fact that they have been, uh, you know, you know, seeking advice and you know, consulting with pretty much all stakeholders, including uh, you know, people in the industry, corporate leaders. Uh, uh, for months now, more than a year actually, with uh, obviously behind closed doors. But the fact that this has come about after multiple rounds of consultations, and yet you have the same kind of complaints that we had about two years ago, shows that the industry is not really concerned about workers or improving the conditions of the workers, despite show, despite studies showing that they are 
you know, quite vulnerable or unexploited. So that is something like the, we need to take uh, that with a pinch of salt, but definitely it is going to be a task of health for the Labour Party to get the bill passed to begin with, and also to get industries to, uh, sort of industry leaders to actually uh, be on board of it. And then of course implement uh, what what the bill contains and, and give those rights to their workers. Uh, we leave it there for today, Anish. Thanks very much for that update. And we'll ask you to, of course, track the progress that that bill makes in the Australian Parliament as and when that happens. Right, and with that, we bring to a close this episode of the Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Also, since I forgot to mention it at the top of this show, uh, if you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe, uh, to share, uh, to follow People's Dispatch on the social media platform of your choice. Thanks very much for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode of The Daily Debrief. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.